Uh, shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the second day or yom of the eighth month on our Creator's calendar as we reckon it, which happens to line up with October 14th, 2023 on the Gregorian calendar. And we're covering the topic because it came up in one of our brother's readings. Uh, he was going over the book of Numbers and the uh, foretelling of Bilam there where it mentioned the Katim. And he had remembered where we had talked about how in the book of Gad the Seer, chapter 2, it related the Katim to Edom. And he was curious about how we know that the Katim means Rome and how we know that's talking about Rome today. So, uh, willing, we'll be able to share real quick just what we know that ties in the Katim to being Rome. So that you can look at these words, which in this description of this video, we'll have the Strong's numbers for all of these words. The Katim, Edom, Esau, Rome, Babel, daughter of Babel, maybe. That's another one, but it goes along with it. And these are all tied together. They all culminate in what we know as Roman Catholicism. And that can be made abundantly clear once you have this connection known. So my point is to show how this is factually true. And the best way to do that is to go right to the source. We have scripture, and very briefly, the first mention of Katim is in Genesis and Yobelim as the son of Yahweh, the son of Yepheth, who's of the sons of Noah, right? They get the north and the the isles, if you will, the, the place north of the Mediterranean, what we call Europe, Italy, Greece. These are Yawin is what we call Greece. It's contemporarily known. And the Katim is generally what we call Italy or where Rome is. But they weren't always known that way. It was over the course of time. And that's what we'll go on here. I'll be perfectly honest with you. I don't know if they were originally in the island of Cyprus or not. I know that they say there was a Phoenician colony, meaning there was paganized Hebrews that intermixed with the indigenous people there. The same thing happened on the island of Crete, as far as I'm aware, which you can find and also in Sicily and in Gaul, where paganized Hebrews intermixed with indigenous peoples, although in Gaul, the indigenous people just fled away for a while and they went elsewhere. However, the um, the fact behind it, it, there's only one witness that mentions the Katim anywhere in scripture as being an island and every other reference of it is as the, the Greek Roman influence, which is what we'll see right here. But this is from the Penguin edition of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'll also have a copy or a link to this if possible. The uh, the version that I downloaded it from wasn't available anymore, so I might have to upload this myself. We'll see. But this part, I'm, I'm going to cover different sections in here. I just typed in Katim, and we're going to look at what it has to say. If I had the time, I would go through every one of the Pesars, uh, the commentaries, if you will, and every mention of the Katim, so you could read it for yourself and see what it says, because it gives you verses from Nahum, from Amos, Habakkuk, the different foretellers where it's talking about the things of Rome. And then it mentions the interpretation or the fulfillment of it as applying to the Katim which is what we'll, I'll show a little bit, but we can't go over every one. We just don't have the time. I will link it all for you to do that on your own. And then if you just go through all of the writings and what they say about these people, there is a curse on the Philistines by Yitzhak in the book of Yobelim that mentions that the uh, evil ones of the nations will take them up by the sword and what those don't get the Katim will take out. And what the Katim don't take out, the righteous nation that rises up will finish off at the end. And that goes along just right with Daniel, that the fourth beast kingdom, which is Rome, would rule until our Mashiach returns. 
So, and that's the same thing that you can find in second Daniel, where it has that fourth beast kingdom reigning for a duration, a long time until the vine and the floods come and wipe it out. Um, so you see these patterns and pictures. It's also known as the, the, uh, the war scroll in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It goes through the, the major war against the Katim at the end of time which is not just a physical battle, but also a spiritual one. There, there's a lot of these things throughout the scriptures. And if you take the time to look at it, there is a full picture of everything that Rome is doing, everything they claim that's blasphemous and evil that he condemns. And also, if you studiously look through the book of Revelation or you study the Antichrist for Dummies videos, which is on the A Christmas is a Lie YouTube channel, I'll also have a link to those. If you study them, if you prove it, not just believe everything that's said, but prove it, you'll see that Revelation is just like how our creator judged the Mitzrayim or the Egyptians, where they he put what they worshipped as their own punishment against them. He brought their own offenses to fact to show that they're not mighty ones that they worship. That same thing is what he's doing to Rome throughout time. He keeps punishing them for the Trinity and for the blasphemous things that they're doing, including the blood like waters in fresh and salt water in America and the world today for keeping the Christ Mass, which is the institution of Sixtus the Third from the Nicolaitan Catholic Christian religion. So all of that stuff plays in. And if we just pay attention, we'll learn what's really going on. The back on point. This is, I'm not going to go into all of this, but this is talking about the history of the scrolls and how they came to you, okay? Right here, it says, the chief sources of the sectarian history, which is what the author here believes. The author of this is a PhD doctorate. He's got a few other doctorates from uh, honorary ones from different colleges. He's been studying the Dead Sea Scrolls since they came about, literally for decades. And he made and had this book published in 1991 because he was dissatisfied with their not making it known to the public. He did not translate any of the texts that were gibberish that were too broken up to be useful. So there's a lot of stuff that is not included. But what is included is very impressive and it was very beneficial to people. Okay. It says the Damascus document in the Bible commentaries or Pesharim, which is right here. You see the commentaries, right? The commentary. That's a Peshar, right? Identify the community's principal enemies as the kings of Yawin, Greece, and the rulers of the Katim, the Romans. So you can see that they knew that. And he gives you a little more information here. Also, the Nehum Commentary's historical perspective extends from Antiochus, no doubt Epiphanes, from 170 BCE. He's the one that was foretold in Daniel that would be the little horn that rose out of the Greek Empire from the north and would sweep to the east, to the south, and to the, the Promised Land, causing great devastation. He set up the statue of Zeus in the temple and slaughtered a pig on the altar on December 25th. And for three and a half years, they profaned the dwelling place, right? Until Yahudah Maccabee and his brethren had liberated it. But that was a type of the coming abomination of desolation where the image of the false mighty one would be set up in the temple, which is our heart. The, the dwelling place of Elohim is man. And we would slaughter the pig on the altar. Again, if you look at the uh, the Latin for pig is Seuss. Seuss in Hebrew is the horse. We've gone over that in a different video. But all these things tie together and prove the, the facts here. Sixtus III establishing the Christ mass with the Jesus Krishna is exactly the slaughtering of the pig on the altar and the, the mind of a man or the heart of man that was the abomination of desolation that was coming. But um, I digress, so please forgive me. We don't want to go too far away from this, but I want to show you it takes place, the Nahum commentary takes place from Antiochus Epiphans to the conquest by the Katim, 
which is about 63 BCE when Pompeii came in, okay? This is stuff that they know about, all right? Here's another mention of the Kitim, all right? It's talking about the priest in the last judgment. The, um, the author of this version has particular views that I don't necessarily agree with, not because they're wrong, but because I don't know enough to have a, a, an opinion one way or the other. He stipulates that it was one of the Maccabees after he was appointed. I think it was Yohan, uh, Yahu Nathan, who was appointed by a Greek king to be high Kohen when that was not how it was supposed to be instituted. And that was originally what caused the schism between the uh, true sect of people who went off in the wilderness with them and stayed there and then eventually founded the uh, the Qumran and the New Covenant people in Damascus and with the believers that stayed in the land. I don't know if that's when it started happening or not. But I do know that in the Apostolic Constitutions, the Maccabees were approved. In the Maccabees themselves, their prayers were answered. They were fighting for the people. And it does mention that they did not stay in... Uh, temperance they had lost their temper yahuda maccabee's father matith yahoo um, couldn't abide by what was going on and started fighting but here back on point it says in the commentaries on habakkuk and nahum the katim are represented as instruments appointed by elohim to punish the unrighteous priests or kohanim of yarushalayim the war rule, however, testifies to a changed attitude towards them on the part of the sect by making the Ketim appear as the chief allies of Belial. Belial here, which in Hebrew is Belial, which is a title that means literally without worth or worthlessness, and it's a title for Satan. Okay. At first, the Ketim were a republic, and it was, okay, but they were used as instruments of his wrath against the wicked people, just like the Babylonians were. However, at the end, they're ruled by a king. And their chief is Satan, because that's what happened in the course of time. So it's even reflected in the scrolls here, as you can see. I forgot to back up real quick. Um, right here, it talks about Another point of interest is that the enemies of the sect are the alluded to as the wicked of Ephraim and Manasseh. The wicked of Ephraim and Manasseh. This is by a sect of people living in the desert of Yahuda after the Babylonian captivity, after hundreds of years where the northern kingdom was taken out of the land. But they're talking about the wicked of Ephraim and Manasseh here because they put this title as alluding to the Pharisees and Sadducees. And you see that in the text, and that is foretelling what would later happen with Ephraim and Manasseh, Britain and America, as a people. And I thought that was absolutely amazing. I didn't really get that connection until recently. But when you go through these and you're reading that, you keep that in mind. That what was playing out in the land was foreshowing later events. <clears throat> We read this one, all right, right here. This I kind of wanted to get to. The chronological framework, right? What it takes place with, all right? It says, the Nahum commentary implies that a king by the name of Antiochus was alive at the beginning of the period with which the documents are concerned. This Antiochus, although one among several so-called, can only have been Antiochus Epiphanes, notorious for his looting of Yerushalayim and the profanation of the temple in 169-168 BCE. The going away into the wilderness with these people happened about 167, and it, they didn't become a sect or a, an official community with a constitution until about one, um, I think it, they said it was 140? It might have been a little bit after, 
but the point is they were they were people there they were they were there and they were forming this group a little bit before it became a, a serious uh, constitution covenant keeping people in a group specifically they were just kind of fleeing away from the error that was happening this is more significant as the chronological pointer is the dating in the Damascus document of the sects beginning to the age of wrath 390 years after the conquest of Yerushalayim by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. This is mentioned in the Damascus document in what's called the Exhortation. Okay, It says, this should bring us to 196 BC, but as is well known, this is what they say. This is the Yahudi historians were not very reliable in their time reckoning for the post-exilic era. I think it was intentionally tampered with if there's any error to it personally. Because all of these events and everything that's going on is literally talking about the times right before the advent of the Mashiach. Both in the land at the first coming and the conditions that we're living through today before his return. So it, of necessity, the, the ones that are lying to us, the enemies that would lie to us as Moshe foretold and we would tread upon their high places. Um, that's what they're doing, staying true to what is in the word. This is, they do not seem to have a clear idea of the length of the Persian dom domination and they were in addition not free of the theological influence of the book of Daniel. They shouldn't have been free from it because it's the truth, right? Where a period of 70 weeks of years, i.e. 490 years, is given is separating the epoch of Nebuchadnezzar from that of the Mashiach. As it happens, if to this figure of 390 years is added, firstly, 20, during which the ancestors of the community groped for the way until the entry of the scene of the teacher of righteousness, which is what is mentioned, right? For 20 years, they groped blind in the way, right? And then for another 40, for the time that the teacher was alive and doing his thing, then you have the 450 years, right? And they say, if you add the, if you add the other 40 for whatever, they say it comes to the 490. The point is, it says 390 here. There's 490 years from Daniel's pronouncing uh, when Darius or when uh, Koresh announced the return and the rebuilding to the coming of our Mashiach is exactly when it was happening. This is within that time frame. And when you add up the things that are involved, it actually can line up properly. There's some supposition here, so I'm not really interested in going into the into that because it might not be accurate, right? Right here, this is an important part. It says, yet if the literal figure of 390 is rejected, which it doesn't need to be, and when you add these things, it fits perfectly, right? There are still compelling reasons for placing the age of wrath in the opening decades of the second pre-Nazarene century. Only the Hellenistic crisis which occurred at that time, and which is recalled in various Yahudi literary sources from the last two centuries B.C., provides a fitting context for the historical allusions made in the secretarian writings. And they say secretarian again because they're trying to separate it from the rest of scripture. But then he quotes nothing, nothing that they have that all points to the same things. Daniel 9 through 11 talks about the rise of the Greece kingdom, the little horn from Antioch is coming to power, and the rise of the Maccabees, right? Hanok this is chapter 90, 6 through 7, and actually the entire chapter, I believe, is about the time of the Maccabees and the the things coming to the advent of our Mashiach and then going on to the judgment, right? So it kind of skips through his first coming all the way to his second coming, whether or not it was removed or whatever, it, that's how it plays out. But that part talks about the Maccabean period. Same thing is right here, with which is mentioning Antiochus and what happened. Also mentioned right here, Yobelim 23. Okay. And the, that's 14 through 19. And the Testament of Louis, where he goes through talking about the different eras or epochs as related to the uh, Kohanim of his children who would be at that time. 
Also, the assumption of Moshe mentions these times. And that's in addition to all the other writings in the Dead Sea Scrolls, because Daniel was here, Hanok, Yobelim, the Testament of Louis, were all part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? But in addition to that, you have the Peshars and these other things that mention the Katim and these times. What they're talking about in the Peshars are the people living through those times using the foretellers and how it applied to them in their life. That was what these writings were about. It says also it is the Chesedim, or the lovingly kind ones, right? of the pre-Maccabean and early Maccabean era who best correspond to the earlier but unorganized group as it is described there, which they, their premise is the Hesedim was the earlier group that became what they call the Essenes or the Qumran community, the sons of Zadok and those that were, that were turning from the apostasy to keep the truth outside of the land. Kind of like those that fled to the wilderness to keep the truth later on, right? It says, as for the terminus ad cum of Qumran history, as this is linked to the appearance of the Katim, meaning the end of their history, right? We have to determine who these people were. In its primitive sense, the word Katim described the inhabitants of Kition, a Phoenician colony in Cyprus. And they get this from one part of one scripture this is the one thing right i don't know if that was added there to sometimes like in um yahudith they have the wrong names and they're talking about the assyrians and different people who were not alive in that time period it wasn't the assyrians that were attacking her it was the babylonians but they used the wrong names for the people as a type of code to to avoid persecution, if you will, or whatever. And that kind of thing could have been playing out here. I don't know. It could have been literally that the sons of Kittim were on that island because the islands were given to the sons of Yepheth in the Mediterranean. And they later also moved and migrated there. But there was Phoenicians, meaning Hebrews, the sons of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob, and the sons of Kittim, mixing in those islands, at least in the uh, possibly Cyprus, I think that was the right one, Crete, Sicily, and again in Gaul, Greece is a mixture of the, the city-states that were founded by the Hebrews and the sons of, Yal, uh, of Yepheth that, that were Yawin. At the fall of Troy, some 80,000 of these Greek paganized Hebrews, Trojans, went over to Italy and mixed with the sons of Katim there to become the Roman or the Latin people. And I say Italy, it was never called Italy until the times the Germans came in and took over. So just to be perfectly clear, as far as I'm aware, it wasn't called that. But here we go. It says, later the name tended to be applied indiscriminately to those living in, quote, all islands and most marine time countries. That's Josephus Antiquities. And again, this is, while it's a wonderful source, it is not always reliable because it was heavily tampered with by those contemporary to the, the destruction of the land. The very people responsible for destroying the land, the ones that were Vaspasin, who was uh, foretold in Revelation as the one that came into power with the four horsemen, right? the, the time of the four Caesars, um, they they heavily censored it. They tampered with the stuff. They made it seem like they were not evil. And if you read the accounts in there, it's very clear that it, it is pro-Rome, which no one would have honestly written that without rebuking the idolatry that they took part in. But I'm getting sidetracked again. The point is, it's not always a reliable source. So while it might mention that, it doesn't mean it's accurate. We can't we can't trust that as as one hundred percent proof. But it is evidence, and you can also find this in the scriptures. When you look at the Katim in in what we call the Bible or the common scriptures, it mentions. Um,
I think it's Bereshit, yeah, from Genesis, Bereshit, chapter 10, verse 5. After listing the sons of Japheth, including Yahweh and the Ketim, it says, From these, the islands or coastland peoples of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language, according to their, their nation, right, their tongue. Now, when the Caldonians went to Gaul, the indigenous people there, or some of these sons like of uh, Yawin, just fled north. I believe those were what we'd call the Finns today, which were still indigenous and their own peoples when more Hebrews took over the, the northern areas there of Sweden and Norway, and the Finns moved again, but they still kept their own identity. I can't, I don't know that as a fact for certain, but I, that's what I believe happened. So it says, but from the second century BC, Yahudi writers also used Katim more precisely, meaning in all the writings that are contemporary with the Dead Sea Scrolls that were hidden and not tampered with, okay? They're more precisely to denote the greatest world power of the day. In Maccabees book one, chapter one, verse seven, or verse eight, sorry, is that Maccabees one, book one, chapter nine, or sorry, chapter eight, verse five, they are Greeks, right? Alexander the Great and Perseus are called kings of the Katim. And again, that could have been one of those like calling them the calling the babylonians the A asher that could have been intentional to hide that or it could have been trying to muddy things up but right here it says in daniel 11 verse 30 on the other hand the katim are romans and this is directly translated as romans in the original in the ancient greek septuagint if you look at daniel 11:30 it mentions that it's the ships of the Romans that would come and force the Antiochus to return, which is what he's talking about right here. It was the ambassador of the Roman Senate, Pompilius Lanius, brought to Alexandria by ships of Katim, i.e. the Roman fleet, who instructed the, quote, king of the north, unquote, the Seleucid monarch Antiochus Epiphans, to withdraw at once from Egypt because... They had a covenant with them, right? The term Romans is substituted for Katim already in the Old Greek or Septuagint version of Daniel 1130. None of these texts is critical, meaning they don't speak negatively of the Katim, but they prove that the Katim is Rome. This one right here shows that the Katim were Rome, and it was known as that in the time the Septuagint was made. So before Rome came to power, this was known. That was the point. They are seen as the ruling force of the time, but not as hostile to Yisrael, which if you look at the Maccabees, the when the Romans came to power as a republic, as a unified people by the consent of the governed, right, all of one mind, they became dominant. They were making covenants with people and keeping their word, and that was making them powerful in creation. So they also made covenants with Yisrael or Yahuda in the land at the time. And you can see that with what happened during the, the, the course of the events through the Maccabean books. There's five of them. It says, in fact, in Daniel, they humiliate the enemy of the Yahudim, which we just read. It is not till a later stage, especially after 70 A.D., that they come to symbolize oppression, and I say it's before then. It was, it was after 63 BCE that they were starting to be shown as oppressors because they were doing things in the land against the people. But it says, in Habakkuk commentary, the portrait of the Katim is neutral, as in Maccabees and Daniel. In the Damascus document, they play no part the alien adversary there is the chief of the kings of Greece, feared and admired by all. 
They are seen to be on the point of defeating the last priests or Kohanim of Yarushalayim and confiscating their wealth, as they have done too many others before. And that's exactly what happened when they destroyed the, the place. You can read it in Josephus or Yahusif's War of the Yahudim, right? Which I would encourage everyone to take the time to carefully study because the things that were going on in the city with the siege of the Romans is exactly what's going on in the worldwide scale today, and they're turning it up. It's what they want. It's what um, that Charles Wilcox actually talks about and foretells in the book that I just mentioned, the priest, the little horn. It says Pope, but I don't ever call him that because Pope means father, and we're not to call any man father. He is the little horn in the scriptures, though, represented as the son of perdition, known as the Antichrist or Anti-Mashiach, the, um, yeah, the one in whom Satan dwells. So I, not something we want to be a part of in any way. But he foretells in that book the fall of America with it for the same reasons why Yisrael of old fell. And the reason why is because we're not repenting as a people. But if you look, the Yahudim did not repent as a people when our Mashiach came. And if you look what happened to them during those times, you'll get a good idea of what we can expect in the future. Such a representation of a virtuous and advanced, and this is why this stuff is hidden, by the way. Such a representation of a virtuous, or victorious rather, and advancing might would hardly apply to the Greek Seleucids of Syria, who by the second half of the second century BC were in grave decline. But it does correspond to the Romans, whose thrust to the east in the first century BC resulted, resulted in their triumphs over Pontus, Armenia, and Seleucid Syria. And finally, with the arrival of Pompey in Yerushalayim in 63 BC, in the transformation of the Hasmonean state into Judea, a province of the Roman Republic. Since the identification of the Katim as Romans is nowadays generally accepted, in 1991, generally accepted. But how many people talk about this? It will suffice to cite a single but very striking feature in the Habakkuk commentary to support it. Interpreting Habakkuk 1, 14 through 16, as referring to the Katim, the commentator writes, quote, This means they that they sacrifice to their standards and worship their weapons of war. And this is where you can find that particular quote. In 1QP Hab, or Hab, okay, that would be column 6, lines 3 through 5. It says, Now this custom of worshiping the Signa, or the ensigns, the flags, if you will, was a characteristic of the religion of the Roman armies both in Republican and in Imperial times, as Josephus testifies in his report of the capture of the Temple of Yerushalayim by the legionnaires of Titus in 70 AD. And this again, this is an illusion of the abomination of desolation that would, was happening in a physical sense at that time. This was from the, the War of the Yahudim, Book 6, okay, Sections 3 and 6, or this would be Chapter 3, Verse 6, I think. The Romans, now that the rebels had fled to the city and the sanctuary itself and all around it were in flames, carried their standards into the temple court and setting them up opposite to the eastern gate, their sacrifice to them. Now, in a minute, actually, I'll do that right now. Just give me one moment. All right, so I, there's more than one mention in here, but this is the ancient history of Caldonia. It is the history of a group of Hebrews that stayed true to our Creator's word that was given in trust to them. When the others had mixed with the paganism in Egypt, they didn't. And when Pharaoh decided to kill off the, the firstborn, they left and were protected. They founded the city of Troy. 
A few hundred years later, the righteous remnant left before the Troy was destroyed. And then that remnant went to Crete, a righteous remnant left from there, and then went to Sicily, from there to Gaul, or what we call France. And from there, they went to Montrose, or Mantrojan, Montrose, in today in modern day Scotland, which was their promised land. And this history takes place from about what 1450 BC to 1290 AD with the death of the Maiden of Norway and the secession wars where Edward the Longshanks came in and took over. But um, right here, it mentions that John, the youngest son of St. Lawrence, who Kadoshi McLawrence had 12 children. He was the sixth McLaurin from the from Troy. And Yahukanon was his youngest son. I think his second eldest was known as Bly, the Blythe. And his clan, he was the Blythe clan that came from that, which I actually have my uh have that on my mother's side. But he said, hold it her, meaning the false mighty one mermaid, the standard of the Roman army. So their standard was a false female mighty one, right? They have more, and it actually talks about them worshiping their, their standards in, in this book and then cursing them also, depending on what was happening because they were getting beaten severely. But um, I don't know where that's at at the moment. When I find it, I'll show more references. So just give me one moment. All right, so back on track here. This, this is the witness from, I believe it was in Habakkuk. That talks about them worshiping their standards. Also in the the Peshar or the interpretation of Amos, when it talks about the one that cast its net on the sea and it worship it, it worships its net and it uses that to gain to to proliferate all the nations. That's directly mentioned as the Katim using their armies and war as their their means of worship and what they use to acquire all these goods. So we'll see that in just a moment here. But uh, I highly encourage you to read those on your own time. All right. So it is also worth noting that the Katim of the war scroll, the final opponents of the estological Israel or Yisrael, are subject to a king or emperor, which if you remember originally, the founding of Rome, it was a monarchy. It was founded by the the uh, relation to Aeneas, the survive, the paganized survivor from Troy, who was of the sons of Zerah of Yahuda, right? He had intermarried with the ruling people, the daughter of the ruler of the Latinum Confederation, and then his children were come to power. But they originally had a monarchy after Sixtus, the seventh monarch's sixth son, who had raped a woman. They abolished the kingdom, the monarchy, and established the republic, of which they start coming to power here. In the book of 4th Ezra, he's given a vision of the fourth beast of the book of Daniel, that in more detail as a three-headed eagle. And when its feathers start to reign, that's when the Caesars start with the monarchy with Julius, and it goes on from that point on, just for some context there. But And it talks about how previously they were known as governed by rulers, and that's exactly what you see in the Roman history. All right? <clears throat> Excuse me. It mentions quite a bit. I don't want to get too far away from what's going on here. You mentioned the Age of Wrath. All right, so the future expectations in the covenant. I'll, I'll leave you with this one for a moment because I don't want to get... There's a lot of stuff in here. I would He goes into detail about the chronology, what they're writing about, his ideas of how things were playing out, which I think it's generally accurate, but you want to read these things for yourself. Don't just take what anyone says, right? Um, Here, we'll leave you with one more thing here. 
I wanted to share directly if we can in one of the scrolls. Here we go. Oh, this is from the, the war scroll. That won't help. The war scroll is estacology. It's about the last battle and things of that nature. It, it doesn't have to do with the history of what we're trying to look up, though. So to prove that's the Kitim would, would not be as easy from that point. All right, so you see commentaries on Yeshiyahu talks about the defeat of the Katim and expounds on the messianic foretelling. If you know that the Katim is the last beast kingdom, then everything makes sense. Um, I don't know how unfamiliar you are with it, but if you read through the foretellings in Daniel, both Nebuchadnezzar's statue and the uh, visions from Belshazzar, or the dream from Belshazzar and Daniel, they all go over the beast kingdoms that were and in different Forms. One talks in detail about what would happen during the Grecian reign and what would happen with Antioch's Epiphans and the different infightings and things that would go on. And then one goes into de detail about the fourth beast kingdom and how it'd be fearsome and awesome afterwards. And again, fourth Ezra with the three-headed eagle goes into even more detail. There's others that also talk about that, but all the Peshars in here also speak about those things that were going on. All right. If I could find one more for you, that would be nice. Yeah, see, their horses are swifter than leopards, and they're fleeing, or they're fleeter than evening wolves. Their horses step forward proudly and spread their wings. They fly from afar like an eagle, avid to devour. All of them come for violence. They look on their faces is like an east wind. It says, this concerns the Katim who trample the earth with their horses and beasts. They come from afar, from the islands of the sea, to devour all the peoples like an eagle, which cannot be satisfied. And they address all the peoples with anger and wrath and fury and indignation. For it is, as he said, the look on their faces is like an east wind, which is like a dry east wind, which is also to do violence. Uh, it goes into detail about how their commanders despise fortresses of the peoples and they laugh at them in derision and they capture them and they encircle them with the mighty hosts and out of fear and terror, they deliver themselves into their hands to destroy them because of the sins of the inhabitants, right? Just like Babylon was being used, just like the Assyrians were being used. All right, um, there's one part i really want to show you because it there we go this is from let me back up i want you to see it. i believe this is the commentary from Amo or habakkuk there we go okay this is the one that talks about their nets and how they worship their standards okay and then it goes along with what we just read from the war of the yahudim and then again there's another part in the ancient history of caledonia where they're literally worshiping their standards. So if I can find that again, I'll point it out to you. But right here it says, it says, you dealest with men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things that rule over them. They draw them up, or they draw all up with a fish hook and drag them out with their net, and gather them in their sin, their sinew. A standard is a flag, like the like the like the flags they use for armies. The standards are the ensigns. They would have depictions of their false mighty ones on their flags, and they would worship them because they use their armies to gather the wealth for, from the nations. Right. That word is saying as in a net. Sane, thank you. Sane. So it says, therefore they sacrifice to their net, 
Therefore they rejoice and exult and burn incense to their saying, for by them, by their standards, their portion is fat and their substance rich. And it mentions the Katim, and they shall gather in their riches together with all their booty like the fish of the sea. And as for that which is said, therefore they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their scene. Interpreted, this means that, sorry, interpreted, this means that they divide their yoke and their tribute, their substance, over all the peoples year by year, ravaging many lands, which is exactly what Rome did, conquest and dominion, and then took their stuff. Therefore, their sword is ever drawn to massacre nations mercilessly. Interpreted, this concerns the Katim, who caused many to perish by the sword, youths, grown men, the aged women and children, and who even take no pity on the fruit of the womb. All right. Now, there's only one people that have ever worshipped their standards like that, that I'm aware of, and that is Rome. It was foretold here. It was mentioned directly in the book, or in Yahusuf, in the War of the Yahudim, which we just read the excerpt there, right? And that is the connection between the two. Now, when you take those and you go back and you look at every reference, and there's more, there's more in here. If you take the time to read through it, what the Kitim are and what they were doing, it makes it unequivocal that it is Rome. Just through reading through this. That's one witness in the text and the information itself. A second witness we already covered is that in the original Greek Septuagint in Daniel chapter 11, verse 30, where it mentions the ships of the Katim, it mentions the ships of Rome there because the Rome were Katim, and that's the word that they use for it. So they knew that even before they became a power. <clears throat> a third witness is what you can see with Gad the Seer chapter 2, which I have a video that we go over that. We go over one of the Psalms and, and I believe Obed-Yahu or Obadiah because all of them cover this theme. And that also in Gad the Seer chapter 2, you find the connection between the Katim and Edom. So now you have Rome as Edom, Rome as the Katim, and there's the parallel. A second witness that Edom would be like Rome is the parallel that Shaul makes in the Renewed Covenant writings of Hagar being the first covenant in Mount Sinai in Arabia, meaning that the first covenant children would have been Yishmael, the wild donkey of a man, and they were like the wild donkey in the wilderness that wouldn't go unless they had the bit and bridle. From that we have the birth of Yitzhak, which was the promised seed that would come after. And from Yitzhak, you have the birthing of the new covenant times where Yaakov, those who get what they have coming at the hill of what they're doing, going out of the land to labor for his family and possessions. And contemporary with him is Edom. What happened with the rise of Yaakov and the, the spreading of the assemblies outside of the land was the founding of the Roman assembly who, like Edom, was given the birthright but sold it, turned against his brother that he should have loved and persecuted him, stole the goods of his family and plundered their 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 his mother and father, doing everything evil and wrong. That was a type and shadow of the things that would happen later on here. But after you have all that down and you know that the connection's here, you can see that Katim is Edom or is Rome. Katim in Gad the Seer is Edom. And you find that allusion is also applicable through what we can infer in Scripture. Now, when you go through Gad the Seer, the book of Yobelim, every reference in all of the Scriptures for the Katim, Rome, Babel, the daughter of Babel, Edom, and you, you just read it. Go over the narratives for what they do in the stories, Yobelim in particular, and you'll see what the Katim, what, what Catholicism is all about. It's very clear, everything they're doing, all the condemnation against them, the judgments that will happen from the beginning 
all the way to Revelation, you can see that. So in the um, description of this video, I'll have the links for the, the scripture verses for the common scriptures where you can find these words, the link for the uh, the Strong's Concordance where you can find all the references for your for your use. If you have PDFs of the extra writings, I suggest looking up Fourth Beast, Katim. Sometimes it's spelled Shittim, like C-H-I-T-T-I-M. Um, look up Edom or Esau and read what it says, and you'll get a full picture. It all tells the same story. But the the ones that really put it all together is when you look at Babel, e Edom, or Daughter of Babel, and Katim just in the scriptures and in the extra writings here. So with that, um, we'll break for comments or questions. Otherwise, everyone, you have a wonderful Shabbat. We will see you next.